Good morning, um, and welcome to a second edition of our Black Lash uh, Africana Collective Town Hall Series. My name is Njiba. I'm a member of the collective. We're five academics who are charting a new path around um, critical questions to Africana studies, Black studies, Pan-Africanism, and everything in between. So this week, we are going to uh, tackle a topic that is uh, um, both timely and probably near and dear to many of our hearts. Our topic is rebel to rebel. You got no country, you got no flag. So before we start our discussion, I just want to do some sort of housekeeping. Our uh, speakers will speak for about five minutes. Um, and then um, as the moderator I'll, or the host, I'll ask them one question each um, and they'll respond and then we will open up the floor to questions from the collective because we want this to be not just a talk shop but us to really strategize about the way forward we want to certainly allocate more time for discussion and and being able to strategize about what we push forward how we address some of these critical issues and um there's a chat room which is right to it should be to the right of your screen one of our colleagues, Todd, is going to be managing that. So if you have any questions, you can certainly put them there. There's also a button where you can ask a question. So if you have any questions throughout the process, you certainly can ask them there. And then, of course, there's a call to action button. So if you want to do a call to action, you certainly can also do a call to action. So let me tell you a little bit about who we are, and then I will tell you a little bit about the topic, and then we're going to turn it over to our first speaker. So who is, is, is Black Lash? Black Lash, and let me be clear that that is our title properly. Um, and this is a bring your own brunch program, so I hope that you have your own brunch um, quickly. So Black Lash, um, the Africana Collective, so we call it BTAC, BTAC, I believe that's it, um, engages in interdisciplinary research to provide analysis and recommendations on a range of issues affecting the Africana world. And when we say Africana world, we mean those on the continent and those in the diaspora, global Africa. Uh, linked communities with peoples of African ancestry, using our collective knowledge and skills, as well as our grounding as thinkers, educators, activists, organizers, and parents, our objective is to support and inform action towards human flourishing and its safeguards in our worldwide communities. We are independent in our funding. So that means nobody gives us any money. We decide what we want to talk about and nobody is dictating what we say or how we say it. Our research and our directives um, allowing us to work decidedly in the best interest of said communities. So all of our topics, they either come from what we think is topical, what we think is relevant or important, and also what the masses think are relevant and important. And before I um, talk a little bit about, um, and I'm just gonna quickly read, um, talk a little bit about our topic today. I just wanna say that our, the five of us have at least over 50 years of experience in the academy, as activists, as parents, you know, as leaders in the community. So we're not, we're not small fish coming to this game. We, we maybe are medium fish hoping to be big fish one day. So the first thing is <clears throat> when we're talk, we wanna talk about our topic is rebel to rebel, right? So we're looking at flags and the question of statues, flags, and monuments and symbols, and what they mean both to tear them down and also what they mean in order to keep them up. <clears throat> so uh, one of our, um, our introduction to our paper, which hopefully we can put in the chat so everyone can read it, goes like this. Local and news medias are abuzz with images of toppling statues, graffiti on monuments, and a whole lot of people talking about these symbols, including the US and Confederate flags, from a variety of informed and uninformed positions. Mississippi intends to remove the Confederate flag from its state symbol. Country pop group the Dixie Chicks will henceforth, I'm sorry, it's not funny, be known simply as the Chicks. NASCAR has banned the Confederate flag from its racist statues of Robert E. Lee and Columbus have come down as well as statues of King Leopold II. 
What do these and similar instances mean in this moment and beyond? How do we shift through these actions and voices and make sense and make sense of them? What ideas and, and possibilities are these acts and voices of protest lacking? In this month, we take aim at these questions and more. Each month, we will consider topical issues as a collective. We prepare um, individual statements and we co consolidate them into a report and we send out the report. And we send the report out because we want people to have an opportunity to engage with our thoughts because we recognize that we are part of a larger collective and not necessarily experts in the field of bringing down monuments or even in the field of Africana Black or African studies. So lastly, I just wanna make, make a point um, that the last um, meeting, we had some very interesting thoughts about the quality um, of our uh, material and presentations. And so we want to say that we are ideologically aligned in some spaces and in other spaces we ideologically differ. We are not a monolithic um, collective. We're a collective that, that comes from different experiences, historically, geographically, culturally, right, academically, and from an activist perspective. And so some of our pos positions may be similar and some may, they, they may be, they, they may differ. And so with that being said, you may hear things that you agree with, some that you don't agree with, and we certainly welcome you to, to chip in, bring in your own thoughts and considerations, and challenge our notion. Um, there's five of us. We're going to start with Todd, who is going to um, tell us just briefly a little bit about himself, um, and then has five minutes to give us his narrative about this question of um, rebel to rebel. And, and maybe Todd, you can tell us why we chose this topic, rebel to rebel. We got no country, we got no play. Todd, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say good morning to everybody. Um, before I begin, Ishi has a question. She says, good morning, are we automatically on mute? Meaning are the people in the chat room automatically on mute? What's, what's the rules there? So I do believe the people in the chat room are automatically on you. And Jared has let us know, yes, excellent. Okay, great, great, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, thank you. The, the title um, was important because uh, you got no country, you got no flag comes from a conversation that uh, James Baldwin had on television. Uh, and you know, James Baldwin is in vogue. Again, you have Eddie Gard's new book on uh, James Baldwin. And James Baldwin talks about how he was uh, with a crowd of young people and the young black man said, I, I got no country, I got no flag. Okay. You got some feedback here. Everybody all right? Okay. Um, oh, Todd, your volume's a little low as well. My volume's a little low? Okay, I'll, I'll see if I'm up. Uh, let's see. Anyway, he said, uh, I got no country, I got no flag. And, you know, Baldwin said, and I couldn't tell him that he did, right? And, he, and, you know, Baldwin then said, you know, we have to work toward a country, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that's the young Baldwin. And as Eddie Glaude now points out, there's an older Baldwin who's very clear on the nature of America that America does not quote. And that's the Baldwin, of course, of the evidence of things not seen, uh, his last analysis of America. Uh, so part of the, the title comes from that. I'll leave uh, a rebel to re rebel to rebel for another a person to discuss. But I wanted to, to make some brief comments. Um, I wanted to start with one of probably the one of the most amazing speeches I ever heard, and that was one done by uh, Dr. Yelley. I had never heard Dr. Yelley speak, and so the first time I don't remember where I heard her speak, but I was very amazed because she she ended the speech very provocatively. I thought. And I never forgot, like, I don't remember all the things she said, but I remembered how she ended it. And, and maybe she'll talk about that during her presentation. But she talked about how one day Africans are going to go to a museum and they're going to see these people. And they're going to say, hey, remember those people? They caused a lot of problems. And I thought that was, you know, funny and provocative and maybe even, you know, prescient. Uh, in terms of how white supremacy is going to die and it will be in the relics of history. And it's relics that, you know, what we're talking about here in terms of these statues. Now, I could try to make a lot of very profound and deep comments, 
But I think uh, President Trump's uh, remarks last night were quite remarkable. And I think that they're going to be studied for some time because we have not had a full-throated defense of white supremacy. And literally, he, he defends and celebrates manifest destiny by name in that speech that he made last night. So we have a very full-throated cultural war that he really wants to have. And he's identified the opposition, I think, with a lot of accuracy in which he says, you know, we want to keep America and they want to tear down America. Um, so I think we're um, very in a very, very interesting territory because we understand from everything to our history books to even, you know, schoolhouse rock of elbow room, you know, this idea of manifest destiny has always been put forth. And now... There's a battle over that in terms of these statues. I'm of the kind of Naeem Akbar situation, you know, when Naeem Akbar talked about maybe we should have no religious images at all. Uh, he says that in Chains and Images of Psychological Slavery, uh, a pamphlet that I read as a teenager. You know, maybe we need no monuments because this country is not mature enough, I think, to have uh, celebrations of people because they can't handle... Uh, dialectics, they can't handle nuance, they can't handle anything that would allow human society to be actually discussed and debated. So the president last night, you know, welcomed the debate, but of course it was debate completely on white supremacist terms. And I think that there should be as many responses and as many participants in that debate as possible. And I, I believe that this conversation is going to be the beginning of that. So that's my comment. I'm going to go and uh, into the chat room now. And uh, Dr. Yelly, I wanted to thank you for that speech. And um, I will, you know, hear other people talk about the other part of our title, uh, Rebel to Rebel. Thank you. Diva, I think you're muted. Yeah. Aha. You're still muted. You're still on mute. Can you hear me? I'm not touching anything. Now we're here. Now we can hear you. Excellent. So I'm not sure what is up with Crowdcast and the like quick mute thing here, but let's not touch it quickly. I will not touch it again. Um, so thank you so much, Todd, for those very interesting uh, comments. What we're gonna do now is we are going to invite um, Jared Ball into the conversation. He's not gonna speak at this point, but he's gonna be on the screen. We can only have four people on the screen until Todd is gonna manage our chat room. If you have any questions for Todd along the way, certainly throw those into the chat and we can bring him back into the conversation. So the next up on our, our conversation is gonna be uh, Dr. Ayala. Do you wanna take the floor and give us about five minutes of what your thoughts are around this question about statues, monuments, and flags? Sure. Thank you, thank you. Um, it's amazing and it's weird to, to hear someone quoting you from a speech that you don't even remember that you gave. Um, but you know, and, um, for me, um, again, I think one of the reasons that I am in this collective is because of um, a certain spiritual lens that I, I tend to speak and operate from. And um, I, I do recall, it, well, some of my speeches I don't remember because I really, I literally believe I'm channeling, but I remember mentioning Dr. Fukia Bunseki. And I remember him coming to do a talk at Howard about museums and how our medicines and our very living, active artifacts that operate and have ongoing function and meaning in our cultures are essentially trapped and imprisoned in museums behind glass where they can't be effective, where our medicines can't work, right? And um, and you know, so I, I'm I'm assuming, and I think if I'm I'm remembering something. That was kind of the, the gist of what I was saying, that at some point, maybe there will be relics of, of white supremacy that we will be looking at in a museum somewhere in the distant future. And hopefully 
whatever whatever evil <laughs> medicine that is will be locked up and rendered completely impotent. Um, in any case, I think that's really important to kind of bring through this conversation because um, I, I, in my paper, I, you know, I first wanted to echo the sentiments of many people in my community, many people in that, the activist circles um, who are, you know, leveling a very important critique of the pulling down of monuments um, that is happening right now and saying we need substantive change. We don't, you know, you can't stop at pulling down a Christopher Columbus statue. Um, more must happen. Um, and so I'm with them completely on that. I'm I'm only saying, and my only intervention into this is that we should do both. We should do all of the above. We should go past the pulling down of the monuments that are kind of more obviously racist and problematic and pull down, pull down all of the things. Oh, thank you for that, Jared. Um, there's a source he put in there, um, a really important interview um, that everyone should check out. Um, yeah, but I think obviously going beyond that, not just looking at the Confederate flag and the racist meaning that it holds, but looking at the American flag and the racist meaning that it, it holds. Um, but I see what's happening now as an entry point. So I, I'm interested in us looking at two things. One, um, maybe there's a way that the critique can be done more constructively. If my daughter does something that is kind of a half measure, I'll say, that was good. Now, what about going further? Like positive reinforcement. I think that's so important. I heard uh, Dr. Ife Tayo Flannery make this point in another interview. Um, instead of just saying, that was horrible. That's just not good enough. But saying, all right, you did this. Now, can we extend that? Um, I think that's one of like appropriating the action, right? Appropriating it and kind of folding it back into kind of talking about the ways it can be extended into more radical action um, that we what, that some of us want to see, as opposed to just you know disparaging it and 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 kind of casting it away altogether. Another thing that I think a point that I ended with is a, a point made by Fanon. And thank you, Jared, for reminding me that this is someone who is really smart who said this better than I said, but that there's something important that shouldn't be undervalued about physical engagement with the revolutionary process, about physically being involved in our revolution. Um, for me, I believe that you know not everyone is going to be in the courtroom, not everyone is going to be in academia writing about this. Some people need to experience this physically first, in their body first. And I think that that's... Um, I think that that can be a point of entry for some people, a touch tone for some people. Um, it builds political bonds, a political community. There is unity around doing things together with our hands and our bodies. I think there are degrees of physical participation that we should think about, just like there are degrees of intellectual engagement that we have going on. Um, so again, um, and you know, there's much more to say in the conversation about you know, inclusive participation, but. Again, maybe there's a way we can look at this as a gateway um, to more revolutionary action um, and, and extending the analysis of folks who are doing this work um, as opposed to kind of just you know, casting it away. And then lastly, I'll put on the table um, the importance of monuments to African people. And that goes all the way back to ancient permit. Um, and, and what that means to keep up the physical space in that way, and how we still understand that, I think, on some mimetic level, um, what that what that really means. And so, again, we shouldn't discount the work of putting them down, but we shouldn't also un undervalue like what the meaning of monuments and symbols like that have for hum human beings um, in terms of teaching and remembrance. All right, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ayele. So I hope you can hear me now. The mute, the mic is on. Um, so thank you very much for that. I think you've raised some critical points about the importance of monuments for African people, as well as this question of physically getting into sort of pan-African movement and, and liberatory work. Um, and so now I think we're going to hear from Dr. Kwesi, who is going to walk us through his thoughts for the next five minutes about this question of flags and monuments and rebel to rebel. And I'm, I'm going to leave it to Quasi or Jared if they want to talk to us a little bit about the notion of rebel, rebel to rebel. What may, maybe one of you can tackle that begin you, before you begin your conversation. 
And Quasi, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself if you want to. If not, people can obviously Google. The floor is yours. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. I'll, I'll, I'll let Jared tackle the rebel to rebel um, portion. Um, and um, while I definitely appreciate the, the you know the views of my my colleagues um, Yelly and, and Todd, um, I have a different approach to these monuments and flags and the like. Um, and the first, I, I think that this whole idea of 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 icons um, of of a, of a particular nation or political community, a state, a country, a nation. Um, these icons, um, you know, they, they certainly serve a purpose. And, and part of that purpose is both, as Yelly noted, is about remembrance, right? Meaning um, the only reason for a towering Columbus statue or statues is, is, is a shrine to the conquest of the Americas. And each time you pass and look at it, you're reminded of implicitly of that conquest. And um, the question then is, what is your relationship to that conquest? And so when I think about, you know, these folks who are uh, on the streets for varieties of, of, of um, semiotic and, and conflicting reasons, and they are either toppling or pushing to have toppled or pushing to have put into a warehouse or museum some of these statues and monuments, um, I, I do see that there, there is some some minimal, um, I think, uh, benefit you know to that uh, because symbols do have meaning. They do communicate to us. They do speak to us. They do have power. But I also see it as as being very futile. Meaning that um, I think these monuments, whether they are flags, whether they are statues, um, whether they are carved parts of mountains, that um, they. You know, they remind me of the idea of going to a place called a moon and planting a flag, right? They remind me of the um, conquistadors, you know, planting the flag of Spain or Castile uh, in some portion of the Americas. That essentially, these monuments are claims to power, right? And so, um, in that sense, I agree with Yeli that uh, for some people, they have to experience a a a, a grappling with power by literally, literally, physically, you know, in in their blood and and bones, touching and feeling, you know, the, these these iconographies of power. Um, but I also think they are draining of power. That is, um, the emphasis on them, I think, misses um, some crucial points. Meaning, I'm not so much concerned about the physical statues or the flags or, or, or the like, but I'm concerned about, you know, what they what they hide or what they don't disclose. I'm concerned about the, the histories and the stories uh, that they're simply a you know very poor representation of. What I'm trying to say is this, is that if you think about, for example, the Confederate flag, um, we have to also think simultaneously about um, you know, the design and, and, and the, the energy and spirit of that flag, which is in fact the Knights Templars, this, this, this militarized Christian you know, um, group uh, that was uh, massacring, slaughtering, uh, raping Muslims and anyone who did not believe what they believe. And so if you look, take a close look, kind of side by side between the Confederate flag on one hand and the Knights Templar Christian Knight you know, flag, they share more than simple ideology. I mean, they, they, they essentially are part of an ongoing, unfinished um, Christian crusade. Uh, and in fact, if you survey many people in the Arab Muslim world, they still consider the drones and bombing as a part of that ongoing crusade. And so um, I think our sense of history, more than simply to still monuments, uh, has to grapple with this ongoing notion of war because the Knights Templars was a military organization. In fact, they were called the military order of Christ. And so uh, when Trump makes his speech that Todd alludes to, what Trump is also invoking is this militarized Christianity, is, is this idea of an unfinished crusade of cleansing the world of anyone deemed not to be orthodox. And so the statues and symbols are simply distractions in the way of getting to you know, that particular story, in my view. Um, and so I think, lastly, um, I agree that monuments, all monuments shouldn't be, because even the monuments in ancient Kemet or Egypt 
or actually burial tombs, the same thing, Aksum, in what is not Ethiopia. These were burial tombs for the elite. And so uh, the pyramids, you know, they, they, they look lovely and magnificent, but they were actually, you know, um, part of funerary ritual uh, for the elite. And so I think monuments should be abolished completely at for all. And I think, therefore, the energy to be spent is really celebrating more so ordinary people. Uh, because by empowering ordinary people, ordinary people feeling their own self-healing power, then you have the ability to bring that, um, you know, to bear in terms of collective action. Otherwise, I think people begin to uh, continue to, you know, run this hamster wheel uh, where, where they, they feel good because they think, you know, symbols of progress have been achieved. And that contentment of course, puts them back in the same place where we're having these discussions again and again. Thank you so much, Quasi. I think that was a very um, interesting um, and dynamic uh, contribution. One of the things that I took out of this is this, the, the, point, the point that monuments should be abolished for all. We should celebrate ordinary people. So hopefully when we come back to the discussions, hopefully you can elaborate more on that, right? Because I think this is a, a, something that perhaps we don't think about as, as much. Maybe we should be thinking about the celebration of ordinary humans and African, humans in general and Africans in particular and our contributions to humanity, right? So with that notion, we're gonna, we're gonna transition to Jared, um, who is gonna bring us his five minutes. Um, and then we'll come back to one question each and we'll open up to the floor. Uh, Jared, the floor is yours. Uh, first of all, thank you, everybody, the, those who, who joined us, and uh, uh, thanks to, to, to my, my colleagues and comrades in this collective for putting this together. Uh, I think it's really important, and I love that we're having these kinds of conversations, uh, largely because I don't see them happening enough in enough places, despite uh, the explosion of uh, Zoom and virtual conferencing and town halls. I still feel like uh, uh, there's a lot of room for this collective to contribute. Even just even starting where where Quasi ended, um, you just kind of uh, you know threw my own comments into a little bit of a tailspin because I was initially thinking somewhat similarly, but a little bit different in terms of the value of monuments uh, and thinking of my time both in Kemet or Egypt, uh, but also even more specifically uh, and contemporarily uh in cuba where the statues and monuments are all to people indiv as individuals i would probably likely admire but were all meant specifically also even as they commemorated an individual to be a very collective uh commemoration of the grassroots struggle that you're talking about so i'm, I'm wondering if there is some wiggle room in there between what you're what you're saying and what 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 uh, I think a lot of us are critiquing, um, uh, because obviously that we're, we're, you know regardless of the setting, uh, monuments and statues and flags are themselves propaganda. I mean they're meant to create a certain messaging, a cohesiveness, uh, to reflect the dominant politics uh, of that state or society, whether we agree with them or not, uh, and uh, uh, so. I, I'm, I'm admitting that in, in terms of a, a context where I remember feeling very differently, for instance, growing up in Washington, D.C. or around Washington, D.C., I have never experienced walking around and feeling the kind of pleasure in, in, in the surroundings of the statues or monuments that, for instance, I did feel in Cuba and even to a certain extent in Kemet, though I understand your point about them being funerary and for the elite. Uh, I still felt that there uh, some sort of difference, and obviously that's a bias po politically and culturally. Um, in terms of the rebe rebel to rebel, I, just to sort of quickly recenter myself uh, from from my concluding comments here, the 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 from, from as I understood it, and why I liked what we did here, the the point of from rebel meaning a focus on uh, the Confederate flag and people taking down the Confederate flags and symbolisms of the Confederacy, statues, etc to rebel uh, with a focus, and I'll admit my own bias here, to an encouragement that there be more of a rebellion of sorts, uh, however people want to define it, because of the, the conditions as such, to my mind, demand that our only source of power as oppressed people, as, as, as African people, as whatever, however we define ourselves, uh, is uh, the power of social movement and political power 
uh, in the streets, upsetting the setup, as 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 uh, my man DJ U Rock used to say, etc. Um, uh, so we want. I wanted for my own thoughts, and I'll just very quickly in ninety seconds that I have left. That the re <clears throat> the movement from rebel to rebel for me is to say, uh, and I agree largely with a lot of people who feel that there is a, an importance to the physical engagement, to the symbolic engagement of tearing down these statues and symbols. I'm very well aware that as Trump pointed out in his speech, uh, very specifically as I saw in one part saying that <clears throat> we will never ever. Uh, let people attack Thomas Jefferson. And one of the first thoughts I had was, why are we focused on a, a Confederate flag when people like Thomas Jefferson are far more uh, egregious and damaging in, in not only their application of enslavement, but their protection of it uh, and their, their rebranding of it uh, as some sort of uh, hero or heroic, uh, even in his very... Um, um, rape and, you know, uh, infested relationship uh, uh, with Sally Hemings that people have often wanted to rebrand re as somehow, a, 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 you know, some sort of uh, romance, uh, just as was done with Pocahontas. Uh, and what's his name? I mean, it's all this kind of ridiculous. So I'll just, I'll stop here with my initial comments and say that, that you know, m my point really is, if we want to have any corrective and progressive measure, I think we need to move beyond uh, the admitted acceptable and even appreciated attacks of the Confederacy and those symbol, symbol, symbols there. But to me, it's the question is, under which flag was slavery initially made legal, maintained as legal to this day, and under which uh, millions have been killed around the world and in this country, uh, uh, as there has not been a, a, a break in this country's history lasting, I think, more than a decade at most, where the US military has not been used to aggressively suppress uh, someone here or internationally uh, since 1776. And even if you just Google and Wikipedia that history, the US military under the American flag, not the Confederacy, which was only in power for four years in its own region and relative to a war, a state of civil war with a more powerful uh, 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 United States, uh, it, 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 it's the damage done under the United States flag far exceeds to this day as we're in a 20 plus year war in this country, at least in, in, in Afghanistan and, and even seven more, six or seven more expanded under Obama uh, um, uh, that are still going on right now. So uh, that's where I think the, the more of a focus needs to be addressed in terms of tearing down those symbols and the politics and the policies represented and defended by the United States flag. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jared. And and, and also that was an excellent contribution about sort of the, the horrors of the American flag globally, right? And 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 throughout the the the, the African continent. I, I just want to say that my presentation or my um, contribution to this larger report really focuses on, on roads must fall and fees must fall in South Africa. I'm not going to even get into that, not because I don't think it's valid, but I think that as a host, I don't I don't necessarily want to take those privileges. I want to invite everyone to read my contribution um, and recognize that much of what is being said by our four amazing academics here is 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 not just um, can, is, is something that can be transplanted from America to Brazil to South Africa to Ghana, right? And so, so this question about monuments and flags and statues, it's not just an American issue. It's something that is is worldwide, and we really need to tackle from a very global perspective. So with that being said, I want to raise, and throughout the, the conversation, I may bring in a couple of things, but ultimately, we're looking at this from a very pan-African perspective. It's not just an issue of symbols and flags in America, right? But I want to take us back to uh, Kwesi, and I'm, I'm wondering if you can elaborate. I, I, I looked at your um, presentation, and I thought that there was something that was very dynamic. I believe the second, um, the, well, I guess you only have one paragraph. Um, but you say you you say something, and I'm going to quote you, and I'm hoping you can give us a little bit more um, elaboration. You said, "I think we are mistaken to a believe a war with monuments is a substitute for war with the myths and power platforms emanating K-12 college curricula, media and museums, the decrees for work policies, politics, and economic life." I'm wondering if you can elaborate what what you mean by this statement. Okay. Please, sure the floor is yours. Can you give us five minutes? Sure thing. And th thank you very much for bringing us to that. 
so my me the meaning behind that, that particular phrasing was was that um, is is sort of the win loss column. What do we what do we what do we win? And what do we lose in, in in the war against monuments, flags, and icons? Right. Um, and if you tally it up sort of that way, um, uh, again, what I'm really trying to get at is this basic idea that, that, that may, be, may be a bit provocative. My sense is, um, from my travels and time in, in the homeland in Jamaica and Ghana, um, certainly time in Europe, in the States, you know, as well as in Brazil, in the Caribbean basin, is that uh, my sense is that a vast majority of people of African ancestry don't believe we can win. And so if that's at least, you know, tenable for now, just for argument's sake, then what I'm trying to poke at is, is that belief. Because if we don't believe we can win, then any particular human action that flows from that belief is going to be defeatist, right? Uh, it is going to be, you know, um, within the acceptable confines of what constitutes change, reform, and all these other catch words. And so, for instance, if I want to bring this to, let's say, for example, slave rebellions, right, or, or, or in rebellions of these enslaved African peoples, in that in, this, in these United States, the, the highest number was in Virginia, 84, at least recorded, recorded ones. Um, then the next two states, South Carolina, Louisiana, 42, followed by Mississippi, 26. What I'm saying is that those African peoples in those confines believed they could win, <laughs> right? Um, since 1865, there has been no documented record re revolt uh, of any kind close to those prior to. In the Caribbean Basin, the two most troublesome places were, in fact, as you mentioned, Jared, Cuba and followed by Jamaica in terms of numbers of documented insurrections and revolts, right? And I'm saying that those revolts reflect the belief in that they could win, right? Uh, and the resignation to marching, protesting, to the other kinds of symbolic gestures to what people call social change and social justice, I think is a resignation to the belief that they can't win. So. Again, what I'm poking at really is this idea that underneath the, 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 the symbolic gesture, the bodily feel, is it, it, really an idea that we can't win and so we resign. Um, and, you know, I got a, a text message um, from a close friend, and I, I won't say, you know, his or her name, but the sentiment was that, you know, for all these years, you know, I have been, you know, this person has been. Um, you know, following the program, you know, laying out of sight, not revolting, not rebelling, because they have seen the, the, the consequences of what that looks like, right? On the body, on, on, on the psyche, on the collective uh, body. And so, you know, those actions, again, feed this belief that they can't win. And so what do you do? You acquiesce. And acquiescence means that you know, the, the limits, you know, to what people will and will not do, right? Um, and I think finally, you know, um, you know, Harry Tubman say, says it's best, who right now is being almost reappropriated on the $20 bill. Harry Tubman says that, you know, more people of African ancestry would in fact, um, you know, would have joined her in her particular um, move and, and, and fight um, but they believed that they were not enslaved. So again, what I'm really mm -hmm. getting at is really, you know, the belief that undergirds, you know, these actions, the belief that undergirds um, these organizations. I think they believe they can participate, but they don't believe they can win. And for me, those are two different ball games. Excellent, excellent. Um, so that's that's an interesting dynamic, uh, Kwesi. The belief that one can participate, but the belief that one cannot win. So so that that begins to to to, to begin to to make me question some things that Sister Ayala said. She said something to the effect that um, taking down statues ultimately is not transformative. It's not necessarily substantive. 
but there is some physical engagement with taking down statues or protesting. Dr. Ayala, do you want to contribute to this conversation around the belief that people can participate in, if I may, um, of the facade of, of protest, right? Or the facade of transformation or the facade of revolution, but we're really not, we really don't believe that revolution will come. What are your thoughts about that, sis? You're welcome, the floor is open. I think that's an excellent point um, that Brother Clayton made. That, um, and I think that's definitely true that, that many people do want to find some small way, um, small symbolic way to participate, but that there is a, this underlying belief that, that, that winning, really winning, winning and seeing something completely different um, in our lives is, is not possible, certainly not within our lifetime, right? Um, however, in my mind, now this is, this, this, is, this is in my mind, I don't put destruction of a monument in the same category as marching and protesting. I don't. They're different. For me, that's a violent act. There's a lot of danger involved in engaging with these structures um, that I think there's a, there's a there's a there's a level of violence to it that I and and also collective violence. Right, that that I think puts it in a slightly different category for me. Right, and I and I so again, so this is not a disagreement. This is just saying that for me, this is this is I think it almost it's like a turn. It's a corner that that I think someone's turning. I know a lot of people who would mark. I don't know a lot of people who are destroying property and disobeying the law in front of cops mm -hmm. pulling down public So. Um, you know, you get a permit to march. You go ask for permission to march. You see what I'm saying? So I think, um, and again, this is not the end all the be all. I agree that this is not, um, this is not where it ends. This is certainly not um, in and of itself a revolutionary act. I think, again, this is a good way for some people who are not comfortable otherwise uh, disobeying the law, who are not otherwise comfortable with a certain level of deception that Fanon and others have, have said is a part of the revolutionary process and must be a necessary part of, of one, putting it into psychic violence. Right, Stuart Hall and others who talk about psychic violence in very, you know, interesting and very clear ways. Um, so, so I'm saying that for some people, this is like begins. Um, like in my, so in my report, as you'll see, I started with the psychic violence that I experienced working at VCU and having to pass all the Confederate monuments on the way to work every day. Um, I didn't take anything down. I didn't face the monuments. I didn't, you know, I didn't gather some of my friends and pull them down, although maybe some days I fantasized about it. But that would have involved me kind of coming up out of my body in a way and being prepared to deal with the consequences that many of us are not comfortable with. So, so all I'm saying is, um, it, it's, I don't think it should be uh, valued. It's not quite fangless. I don't think it's as modern. Um, and um, I also want to put on the table while I have the floor, um, murals. Murals as these very large public monuments that I think also represent kind of an anti-elitism and definitely tend toward the collective, tend toward a people's expression of power and, and identity and, um, and political and cultural unity. Um, so I think that that's something we could also discuss. Um, maybe there's something in the format that needs to be brought out there. Is a monument the same as a flag? Is burning a flag the same as, as destroying, you know, you know, exploding Mount Rushmore? I don't know. I don't know. That's it. Okay, excellent, excellent. So I think that you're raising some very critical points. The question of violence, right? And the question of types of violence, the question of acts that that are theoretically um, or or societally acceptable, like protest, um, versus the tearing down of monuments, versus um, rebellions, right? Um, so these are all also very critical points. And I'm thinking back to um, what I wrote about roads must fall and and fees must fall. And if you look at the um, the literature, the defacing of Rhodes, the Cecil Rhodes statue at University of Cape Town is really 
what what took off, right? The facing of it took off this roads must fall movement, which included not just tearing down the road statue, but talked about the inequality in South Africa, talked about that, that South African Africans who are indigenous to the continent are being disproportionately um, uh, uh, discriminated against and oppressed inside their own land, while the colonizers or those who are, are benefiting from apartheid or post-apartheid are enjoying life in South Africa, right? And so when you think about the violent act of defacing a, a statute, certainly you, you may or may not be able to um, compare it to someone coming out and protesting poor fees must fall or roads must fall. So I think that you're making a very valid point. And I want us to come back to this question about acts of violence. Acts of violence, are they individual? Are they collective? And how do they impact movements? Let's, 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 I want us to jump to Jared real quick. Um, and, and I had a question for you, and I, and I wanted you to, to kind of pull this out. You mentioned um, monuments in Cuba and in Kemet and in other spaces, right? And, and I, I know um, when I was in Cuba, I, I'm just remembering like Freedom Square and I'm remembering, you know, um, monuments and symbols to Fidel and Che. And, and I'm wondering, is there a difference with revolutionary monuments? Or I'm thinking about in Addis Ababa at the UN headquarters, a statue of Kwame Nkrumah, right? Is there a difference between Mount Rushmore and you know the, the thief Christopher Columbus and a Kwame Nkrumah? What really do monuments symbolize? And, and, and I'm wondering if you can tackle this question about are, is a revolutionary monument, are, what, what do what monuments really do? Is there some ideological, something ideologically behind monuments as, as we pass them every day, as you pass an Nkrumah or you pass a Columbus, what ideologically does that do to the everyday, and I'm gonna say African, because I'm an African, but, but can you take that on Jared? And then once Jared, just to let the collective know, once Jared responds, we're going to drop Jared out and bring Todd back because um, I have a question for him. Jared, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, well, sort of as I was saying before, I mean, to me, the issue is the perspective of the viewer or the state that puts the monument together. So I honestly don't think that there's any difference in terms of the role or impact of a monument in any setting. The, the, only, the, 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 only, the only difference is do you view those on Mount Rushmore as representing a revolution or not? Do you think that Nkrumah represents revolution or not? Uh, so to the many of the Cubans in Miami, the monuments in Cuba are to them psychological warfare. Uh, you know, to Ieli's point, I feel that too, uh, except I also feel that exact same way, honestly, in some, I mean, in, in many ways I feel it even, I think even more so with the American flag uh, and all of the, the the symbolism around it. I feel more um, violently assaulted in that, in, in the sense that it's more disingenuous. Uh, the Confederates were in many ways at least more honest, uh, you know, and look, <laughs> this is what the project is. And as I try to, I think I mentioned in my my, my uh, statement for, for, for Blacklash, this is sort of the difference between what we're given in pop culture between uh, the Confederates and the Southern redneck and what we got in Get Out, which is what I thought was made that film uh, more powerful, was that it referenced, it centered the white supremacy and anti-blackness of Northern liberal elite wine sippers who keep getting a pass despite having created more of the suffering overall than I think those in the Confederacy. I mean, again, the North, not only uh, institutionalized and legalized slavery. They benefited financially. They been they participated directly. Uh, they you know this idea that that once you know they they signed the Fugitive Slave Act, making making it even more legal on a national basis than uh, and not just a Confederate thing than it already had been. So I just I, I when I see the American flag and when I see it flying in my in my own neighborhood. Uh, uh, and sort of like what Malcolm X said, when white Americans say I'm white, that's different than when Europeans, even though I don't really necessarily think it's that different in relationship to Africans, even from Europeans, but, but in a sense, it seems different. 
that you know when when the American flag is flying, I don't just feel like this is a patriotic commemoration to this country's history. I feel like it's involving a very specific anti-black, anti-African, hostile viciousness. Uh, when I was in the Navy, which I always remind people was was me serving a four year sentence. I mean, this was this was directly linked to the criminal justice or injustice system that I and many others ended up in the military. When I was in the Navy, they made it very clear to get you have to ask permission to leave your ship. And part of that asking of permission was to go on to port and leave the, just to leave the boat. But part of that was was having your your even civilian attire assessed. And there was a struggle, and this is in the early 90s for me. There was a struggle at the time where those of us who wanted to wear Malcolm X shirts or even Bob Marley shirts were told that we could not. Whereas those whites who wanted to wear Confederate flags were welcome. And even when you got a ship's jacket where you got a, a, a the, you put the commemorative flags of all the nations you visited on your sleeve, whites would put the Confederate flag above the American flag, which was which was considered you know a very specific. Uh, reminder what they where they held how they ordered the importance that was seen as okay even by the United States military but if I wanted to wear Kwame Nkrumah or Malcolm X I wouldn't have been allowed to do that so so there is a um, both a, a clear uh, a political and cultural importance to these symbols but then there is also as I'm trying to point out here an incestuous relationship between the Confederacy and the U.S. flag that the U.S. flag and its supporters get a pass on. So as I said in the moment at the beginning and I'll end here that you know when 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 Trump and many so-called liberals and democrats would say the same thing about Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, I'm saying those are the ones that should come down well before, you know, Robert E Lee and some Confederate flag. And then the very last piece I just want to point out there because I think what what uh, what what everyone has said, Eli and Quasi in particular have said about the 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 violence and the the engagement of taking down statues. I felt the same way. I've never taken down a statue. I've been in millions of marches. I've never taken down a statue or participated in anything like that. But there is a there is a um, there's two quick points I wanted to make about that. One, in terms of Quasi's point about uh, thinking we can win, I agree. I only try to remind myself that as much as I may have some pessimism or see the pessimism in our folks, those in power are very clear uh, to, and are still totally afraid of that dormant potential. So while we may see the pessimism, they see the opposite. They see a dormant revolutionary potential, which is why we see so much effort put in propaganda, public relations, psychological warfare, which is why we see so much of an effort to rebrand these histories and even to allow some of the symbolic adjustments because they're very well aware uh, and have, and even in 2018, had war games in the US military against what they were calling the potential z bellion where Generation Z, they were predicting by the mid 2020s was going to be in a full blown revolt because of all the inequality that those in power know is only going to get worse even before the COVID crisis. So they're aware of, of, of a potential that I think that some of us don't even see and I, that, that, that I find comfort in. And then the very last point is remember in the early 2000s in the reinvasion of Iraq. It was the public relations company, the Rand Corporation, and its psychological warfare that encouraged the 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 falsely created events of pulling down Saddam's statue as a false sign that that Iraqis were in support of the U.S. invasion when that was a completely staged and de de defense department stunt run by the Rand Corporation. And I only bring that up to say that on some level there is an encouragement by those in power that this be the kind of activity people engage in just to give a false sense of there is some sort of progress occurring when it really isn't. So as much as I'm for it, I just don't want any of us to get caught up in stopping there. Thank you very much. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jared. I think that this is an amazing contribution that Jared has made. And, and I just wanted to, um, Jared has dropped off for just a second. Todd will join us within the next few moments. But something that, 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 that Jared made that I want us to um, bring in uh, as a critical point is this question of, of the flag and, and the global um, the US flag, US imperialist flag, if I may, and the, and the global implications of what that looks like. I'm thinking about Africa. I'm thinking about the militarization of 
um, the flag. You know, I'm thinking about even as as um, Jared mentioned the pulling down of the statute of Saddam Hussein. So even when we're thinking about the the repressive, oppressive, um, and the blood on the American flag, let's remind ourselves that this is absolutely 100% impacting the African continent. It's 100% impacting global Africa, right? And so, so Todd, you know what? I wanted, I wanted to, to bring you back on because I think that you raise a critical point about white supremacy and a cultural war, right? And, and I'm wondering, you, you mentioned something about having no religious images at all. Um, and, and I'm just wondering, when we think about this question of white supremacy in a cultural war and no religious images, I, I, one, I'm wondering how those two go together. And then two, I'm wondering how do we reconcile a question of no religious images with the fact that African people are inherently spiritual? That's one question. And then the second question is about white supremacy. And, and ultimately, we, we don't talk about white supremacy enough. We talk about the flag. You know, we talk about the statues and the monuments. But let's call it what it is. Is it white supremacy? Is it capitalism? Is it the flags? What is it racism? What exactly are we talking about here? Todd, the floor is yours. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say something to Judeo-Christian, if you don't mind. Uh, even in the Old Testament, there's something about no graven images, right? So if we go with Judeo-Christian, let's, let's go with Judeo-Christian for a second. If we go into the fact that we are the embodiment, we are the creation, right? We are the breath of God, right? And that even if we go into Christianity and say, you know, God represented himself on earth, then if we look in the mirror, then we know what we are. Now, white supremacy can never be discussed because to discuss white supremacy means you have to discuss white psychological and spiritual dysfunction. And they will never discuss that ever on any terms ever uh, because they need the image of themselves as God because of the dis dysfunction. Now, you know, I'm, I I'm the interesting part of this collective, right? Because I'm, I'm probably you know, the, the Groucho Marx is here, the comic book geek here, right? So, you know, it, it's not accidental that it was white Jewish American kids who in the 1930s created a character that is basically how America sees itself in America and throughout the world. And that character is Superman, right? The ultimate graven image, right? The ultimate secular graven image um, with the shield on his chest for protection, right? There is something about white supremacy that says, I'm doing this to protect you, which is what makes it so psychologically disturbing because they believe in burning the village in order to save it. They literally believe that. And that's why you have a Rambo, and that's why you have, you know, Indiana Jones, this white guy who goes around the world stealing treasures and artifacts from other cultures. And that's why I wanted to write about that in my um, in my statement. And, and and that's also why, again, to go back to my statement, you have the hated Clubber Lang in Rocky Three attacking Rocky. Where? Where does he attack Rocky at? He attacks Rocky at the statue of Rocky that they're unveiling, which to show white supremacy is a real statue in Philadelphia and was there years before they were embarrassed enough to have to force themselves to put Joe Frazier's statue up there. So they're clear on the relationship between religion and graven image and power because power is what they always talk about because it's their goal because they're so psychologically disturbed they can't live on earth without being in power that's a disturbance that's a psychological disturbance that's a spiritual disturbance and and capitalism is nothing but the economic manifestation of that disturbance and that's that's how i see it Excellent. Thank you so much, Todd. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna pop Todd off. We're gonna pop Jared back on because we have some questions, and Todd is doing an excellent job managing that. Um, and so 
here's what the first question that we have um, is, is a really interesting question, I think. Um, and it's about um, this question of, of the Trump speech. The first question, and, and I'm sorry, I don't know who it's from. And so uh, Todd, if you can hook us up and let us know in the comments. Um, and now we're into the hour of questions. So please, ladies and gentlemen, you know, throw in your questions um, and uh, let us know uh, how we can kind of uh, contribute to this next, next phase. The, the question is the point Trump was making about the false indoctrination was a dog hissel for us who are teaching. How do we safeguard for the increased um, assault on Africana studies? This right here is an absolutely, ah, the, the question was from Dane Peters, excellent. This is an excellent question. How do we safeguard this increased assault on Africana studies? And before you all address this, I just wanted to, um, there's something that I, I was gonna say when Todd was speaking and it, it lapsed me. So I'll come back to it. The floor is open. Who wants to raise this question about how do we address the safeguard around Africana studies and the assaults? Anyone wanna take that one? Hello? Yes, you're welcome. I don't have a huge major comment. I think that is, a, is a, an important question. Um, it's so funny that when you go to type in the chat, it says, say something nice. And, you know, in my head, I'm like, ah, what if I don't have anything nice to say? Um, in any case, um, the assault uh, uh, facing, you know, Africana studies folks is, is not a new assault. It's always been under assault. Um, the, the dog whistling, dogs are always a whistling, um, Trump is, Trump is just an excellent dog whistler uh, and he's not even, no, he's not actually. Um, but I, but I, I will say that there are really important efforts as there have been, um, to think about Africana studies outside of academic institutions. Think about it in ways that don't necessarily have to involve some sort of university. Dr. Carr, Greg Carr, and Howard, and others are trying to, you know, involved in a jailbreak university project. I mean, we've had all kinds of community efforts um, to, to again see Africana studies as a mission-driven field of inquiry that doesn't rely on academic institutions, but really relies on the people. And um, once we start thinking that, we can do Africana studies in our homes. We can do Africana studies in barbershops and beauty salons. Dr. Fia, I saw her comment about how the military polices African hair. Well, we can teach about that and we don't have to be in a college classroom to, to teach about those things and discuss those things. I mean, this is where we are right now. This is Africana studies. This is what what, what we are supposed to be doing with it. Um, and so um, that's, I think, one approach is to kind of get outside of a certain um, model. Of, you know, doing can I, excellent. Thank you so can much. Can I add to that real quick? Um, yeah, jump in. Just very quickly, because yeah, um, <clears throat> I, 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 Yelly makes uh, some good points here. Uh, the first thing I, is my my humble understanding of Africana studies and the history of it is is its relationship to broader political uh, struggle and movements particularly those hitting streets and creating all the kinds of problems I think we're all alluding to in various ways here. Um, so if we wanna save Africana studies, and I, and I would argue that it's in need of some saving, um, uh, we have to, I think, reinvigorate and commit ourselves to the broader political struggle that created it and pushed it onto black campus, onto campuses, not just black, uh, but push those black power studies or black studies or Africana studies uh, onto uh, white and other campuses. Uh, that's, that's what I would think. And then the other point I would want to make, because I, I think it is important as we move into other extra institutional collectives more, and I, and I think we have to, because that's where all of it started. Um, we're in extra institutional settings. Uh, but I think we have to maintain a focus on the collective and one of the, and collective approach to it. And one of the things I like about what we're doing here is that specific point that, uh, particularly with new media technology and, of course, the imp imposition of white supremacy and capitalist logic there is, and academic logic. There is a tendency to make it a very isolated individual approach. 
Uh, and I think that we're also seeing uh, um, an emergence of an individual um, punditry and gatekeeping effect already occurring as people try to be positioned or are finding themselves positioned as an individual or singular spokesperson for an entire wing of, or field of study. And in that process are allowed to limit and gatekeep what forms of that history are brought up and investigated. So that's why I think the kind of work that we're doing here that was encouraged to some of us specifically by Dr. James Turner at the Africana Study Center at Cornell, even very recently, uh, and I know that this informs the kind of traditions I think several, all of us and really are coming from that the collective work uh, uh, and approach to the study and dissemination of the studies, I think most important and more important right now, maybe um, than ever, maybe more threatened right now as an approach than ever. Excellent. I, I, I think that you made an excellent point about gatekeeping and I'm just wondering um, and, and about sort of the evolution um, or the emergence of Africana Black Studies and African Studies. And I, I think it's an interesting dynamic because if you look at the emergence of African Studies, specifically in the US, you have African Studies being an ethnographic study of those African people, right? But now African Studies on the continent, however, ultimately is very much in the tradition of Black Studies and Africana Studies in the U.S. and around the world. This, this question of, of, as Kwame Nkrumah says, managing our own affairs. And so I'm wondering if you all can speak to this question, not just about gatekeeping, but about African academics, and excuse me to say, who are financially profiting off of African history, African knowledge, um, and, and even off of the works of Fanon or Nkrumah. What are our thoughts about that? And how does this positively or negatively impact the larger movement for Africa and Pan-Africanism? The floor is open. Kwesi, do you want to take that or anyone else? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in very quickly. Um, well, I'll try to tie the two strands together. One strand is, of course, the, the, the discussion about monuments, flags, icons, and symbols, representation. The other, of course, is about Africana studies um, a, a, as, a, a, as, an, as an approach to understanding, um, you know, the African world experience um, in, 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 you know, in, in, in its context. So um, my, my quick sense is, is that how much we want to save Africana studies, uh, I, I think, it is is really um, this issue of of of, of power, which um, Jared spoke to early on. I think a few others of us did that. Is that uh, uh, unless we really get a handle, a grasp on, on how on how power works, how power metastasizes, how power attracts and co-ops, and uh, that power it isn't, it isn't it isn't a ghost, right? It, it isn't this it isn't this phantom that hovers over our life. It's real because power is made and wielded by other human beings, right? And I like to think about this human field as from from this perspective: human beings have no natural predators uh, except other human beings. And so, if you think about this, really, you know, this contest of power, um, we have to really think, I think, really clearly about what constitutes and really imbibes this power. So when I think from that perspective about Africana studies, Africana studies, both you know, in its iterations in the continent as well as in the States, um, you know, in the terms of the James Turners of the world and, and others, it was insurgency because it had to be insurgency, but because I, I think you know, the insurgency movements um, face this trap, right? That is, they have to appeal to the same institutions for which they argue against. And the trap is that they are, you know, the way institutions work is that they are about managing change, right? They're about managing, um, you know, threats to its survival. And so what many universities did in the United States and in Europe is that they thought to provide space for participation, um, but not for funding, not for recognition. And so ultimately, Africana studies, you know, essentially, um, you know, was appealing to the very structure for which it fought against. And for me, that's not a contradiction. That's really this, this, this predicament 
that the after world finds itself in. Um, and so it's the way in which power works. And I think we have uh, a great mishandling of what how power really works. That power does not work uh, because power will grant you participation, but then it will devour you, right? And so, for instance, my the beloved Africana studies that Jared and I experienced at Cornell University has been devoured, right? Um, and the, the beloved Institute of African Studies in Ghana, Legon, is not what it was in the 60s and 70s by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, Ibadan in Nigeria, devoured. Um, the institutes that were established in Dakar, Senegal, devoured, right? Um, those institutes that were established um, in, correct me if I'm wrong, over in East Africa, um, in Dar es Salaam and other places, you know, that was very revolutionary. In fact, Walter Rodney was there, Ikra Amar was there. They have been devoured. And I think those devourings are a consequence of not really apprehending how power works. That power will allow you to mm -hmm. be to the extent that it will then devour you because then that 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 complacency, that that idea that you have arrived is really the the prelude to devouring. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. I think that you are, are making an excellent point, Quasi. Thank you so much. And I think that this is really a question, we are talking about a question of power, right? And, and even when we think about, when you were talking about that, I was thinking about Africana studies programs, whether you're on the continent or whether you're in the diaspora, you're operating inside neo-colonial institutions. So how much power can you really have in a neo-colonial institution? You know, Kwame, um, Kwame Nkrumah in the Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare says that there's this zonal analysis. He says there's an enemy held zone, a contested zone, and a liberated zone. And so one would ask ourselves, in the, at Cornell, at University of Ghana, at Ibadan, at Dar es Salaam, at Howard University, are these African or Africana studies programs operated in enemy held, contested, or liberated zones? So this is an important point. I have a second question for the collective. Um, the second question is, why is it that African revolutionaries have to acquiesce to Abrahamic religion, I believe that I'm saying this correctly, despite it being an integral part in sustaining neocolonialism? This is from Christopher Marshall. And, and, I, and, and am I assuming that by Abrahamic religion, we're talking about Christianity? And is Christopher still on? I'm wondering if Christopher can give us a I little believe bit he would also clarity. mean I, I believe he would also mean uh, the Abrahamic tradition is all of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all those who claim descend to, to descend from Abraham. Uh, Excellent. And, Thank you so much. Thank you and, so much. The floor is yours. Well, my short answer would just be that 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 there has to be a certain level of acquiescence to those because they are the dominant powers that have conquered whatever region we're talking about. So, uh, you know, again, we all have biases uh, spiritually and, and what have you. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think we have to recognize, uh, particularly in, in terms of the Abrahamic traditions as they encounter African people, that they come as part of the colonizing process in Jiba, I think you just were describing. So, uh, uh, and as I've always understood both in Kruma and Torre and others, uh, their argument and approach was, um, there has to be some sort of uh, engagement on that level uh, because African people, as you point out, are spiritual. Uh, and whatever we might think as individuals about these particular traditions, we have to engage our folks on them. So my joke has often become, you know, something like if, 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 uh, um, if you're going to be uh, a Christian, you have to at minimum be like Dr. King and, and maybe Nat Turner. <laughs> Uh, if you're, you know, if you're going to be a Muslim, then your, your guidepost should be something akin to Malcolm X. If you're going to be, uh, you know, a, 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 forgive the, the phrase, but an, an African traditionalist of sorts, then I think that you should, uh, you know, encircle the Asantawas and, and, you know, even Nkrumah. And by the way, uh, even, even check Anta Giop, who I think his approach often and his, his understanding of that cultural, spiritual world with a very deeply uh, rooted material approach uh, was to me a perfect balance. So, but I think, yeah, I, I do think as anyone who has tried to do any kind of grassroots organizing, um, 
uh, I have personally always ha been very conscious to suppress my tendencies towards atheism uh, and and to to approach my conversation around uh, Marx or socialism through the context of African and anti-colonial struggle. Uh, you know, if Cabral, if Nkrumah, if Ture, if Sekou Ture, if others can engage the various so-called European radical traditions through that 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 matrix, so to speak, I think uh, uh, those of us like myself can as well. Excellent. I think you make a, a great point. And, you know, I'm sorry, everybody, I'm going to apologize in advance, but I am an Nkrumah's terrain, so I'm just keeping it real. Um, but Nkrumah says that he's, a, he, and, and I believe he said this in Consciencism, that he's a non-denominational Christian, right? Or, and so ultimately he's, no, did he say non-denominational? That's not what he said. I, I swear I just had it, but I'll come to it. But ultimately what he's suggesting is that, you know, he understand him and Ture, actually, because Seiko Ture was a Muslim, right? And in revolution culture and pan-Africanism, he talks about Islam and he talks about the tenets of Islam. My thing is, as someone who is not necessarily religious, but understands that religion is deeply rooted in African culture, and we understand also that religion is a manifestation of culture, how do we, as Nkrumah says, take our triple heritage, right? Euro-Christian, Arab-Islamic, and traditionalist African culture, and use it as a weapon against oppression? And I think here's what I'm thinking. This is just me personally. Another point we have. This is more like a, a comment. So I'm just going to say the comment, and then um, I'll ask maybe two questions, and I'll give the collective an opportunity to respond. So we have a question from LA, I believe. Even in my country, Ivory Coast, many streets and bridges are named after colonial governments and French presidents. So this is kind of like a comment question, like, like this is not just an American program. And then we have a, a question from Dane P Peters, and I'm, so, I'm, I'm not sure if it's Dane or Dane. Um, and it's, we laud Eric Williams, the scholar, and the first half of his political career, he was on the second, he was one of the second wave of the founders of the, the modern uh, Caribbean. And so I'm not really sure there's a, a beginning of that is hagiography, hey, hey please excuse my pronunciation, read some level of erasure. So I guess the question is a question of, are we, is, is there this section, is there a question of erasure with this, with the notion of monuments or flags or even taking down monuments or flags? And then the last uh, comment that I wanna bring in is, oh, the second, the second half of the, the Eric Williams thing is, Eric Williams betrays his work, placing CLR James on house arrest banning his own books and catering to the white minority group that was racial oppre racially oppressive to black people. So the question becomes, you know, what is, how is this? You know, in the first half of Eric Williams' um, career, political career, he was one of the founders of mod, the modern Caribbean. And then he betrayed his work, placing C.L.R. James on house arrest, banning his own books, and catering to the white minority group. What is that about, right? How does one do an ideological shift of this nature? So here are these two sort of contending questions around Eric Williams and even around the infatuation of naming streets and bridges after colonial governments and French presidents. And let me also say here in Ghana, we have something called the one and it's theoretically named not theoretically it's named the george w bush highway the floor is open quasi jerry Ayala, the floor is open who wants to take these on can i jump in real quickly you're on the floor is open okay thanks um what i'll do i, I want to tag the, the last question as well and i'll i'll tie i'll respond to the question of dane in the comments um you know, made it in that order. So, uh, on on the question of of, of the Abrahamic religions, um, th this is something that um, because I, I study I study belief and, and spiritual and religion. So, he, here here is my 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 thing about um, you know um, th that that I think very haunting question because I think we're we're, we're being a bit evasive. Um, I'm going to push back very strongly uh, to say that. 
uh, and Krumer's view of the triple heritage um, comes, you know, is in fact in part with Ali Missouri. He also pushed the triple heritage idea because um, he and Krumer being a potential um, Catholic priest as his father had wanted. In fact, he's named Francis in Krumer on his birth certificate. And then mm -hmm. um, Ali Missouri, you know, from, from a very uh, wealthy and well-known um, Muslim family in East Africa, the Missouris are very well connected. Um, they're pushing this idea of triple heritage because th there is a particular sense of what I was saying before about resignation. That is um, the idea that they have to play nice with, 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 the, with these theologies that accompany intruders. And um, there is no grappling with it, you know? And so when, when, we, th when we think about, you know, the, the, the really omnipresent role that these um, theologies, um, you know, have had in, 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 in the life, I think we're, we're afraid and very much terrified um, to, to really try to deal with them as, as really the, the, the dogma of, of, of intruders. In other words, um, the, there, is, there is nothing about the triple heritage. Triple heritage reminds me of what, what the mythology in Jamaica about uh, out of many, one people. Well, who are the many? Jamaica is 95% people of African ancestry. There is no many. But, but that particular slogan airing, that icon was created in creating the modern Jamaican state, which was in fact to please the very small minority of, of, of British holdovers and the so-called uh, mixed people um, that were the buffers. And lastly, the business owning Chinese and Indian persons who were an American minority. It was to please them. And I see the triple heritage as this idea of, 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 of resignation, of saying that we can't win. So let me just simply throw a blanket umbrella, you know, o o o over this mess that people just refuse to deal with. So um, I won't take up much time with it, but I think it's something that we should really dig into more closely because it does exercise this power that I think we are afraid to deal with. Um, and until we deal with that, then we can't really deal with the, these these targets, you know, on our bullseye, such as white supremacy, et cetera, because Christianity, Islam, uh, they, they, they bleed with, with, with that notion of supremacy. Uh, Africans in the, in the Muslim world have to resign from having an African ancestry. They can't claim it and claim to be a Muslim. And this is a matter of fact in Saudi Arabia, in Yemen, in Iraq, where the people of African ancestry. Islam erases your African ancestry. Christianity um, does likewise, the same violence in, in, the, in the fact that most of the people in Christian, that is Spanish, Portuguese, English, Dutch speaking colonies that became the modern Americas um, had to erase their names, right? And, and, and baptize not only in these foreign fictions, but also in the ideology, which is to erase African ancestry. And so um, I think we have to circle back to this very important thing. Lastly, on the, on the matter of these revolutions like Eric Williams, you know, again, they operate within this very poor grasp of how power works. And for both Nkrumah and Eric Williams, their model of the modern nation state was Europe and, and the United States, uh, flawed archetypes. Um, and so it is not strange or ironic that Eric Williams would do that to Sierra Law James, because guess what? The revolutionary so-called government at Fort Burnham in Guyana. Remember, Guyana had this, what, socialist revolutionary state, right, that gave uh, a safe space for um, political prisoners here in the U.S., including Herman Williams and a few, uh, Herman Ferguson, excuse me, and a few others. Guess what? It is the same Forbes Burnham that has Walter Rodney killed because Walter Rodney was organizing a political <laughs> party in the same territory. And again, these are suits to so-called revolutionaries, right? Again, I think we have a very poor grasp of how power works, um, a very poor grasp that the nations that we extol as homelands are really part to these flawed archetypes. And they all flow from this acquiescence to Jude Judeo-Christian ideologies. Hey, can I wait on too? Excellent, excellent. And you know what? Um, yes, definitely. Yes, definitely. You're welcome. Let me just say this one thing that I was thinking about when Kwesi was speaking about this question of, of having to kind of please everyone or, or, or you know, um, pleasing a, a small minority of, you know, colonizers in Jamaica. I was thinking about 
South Africa and the rainbow nation, right? And I was thinking about this question of how rainbow is South Africa? When South Africa is one of the most unequal spaces on the planet. When you, when you fly into Cape Town, oh, it's nice airport, it's so amazing. And you drive from the airport, past the huge settlement, right? of black African people that are living in, in straight squalor. I mean, it's it's like miles long. And then you find yourself in Stellenbosch where there's wine, wineries, and you can go and you can sip this and you can do that. And mind you, primarily white people are in Stellenbosch and owning everything. You ask yourself, was this just in order to, in order to, to, to appease a certain group of people in a space like South Africa? So when you said that, it really brought that back also to me. Sister, the floor is yours. Awesome. Um, this is, I'm so uh, in this conversation. Uh, this took me back to something that we talked about in our meeting um, as a collective, um, probably our first meeting offline um, in which we talked about marinage and the, the whole maroon idea, maroon as practice, maroon as approach. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciating the conversation that we're having about kind of the problematicity of the Abrahamic traditions. Um, and I, it made me think of a meme or like a photograph I saw this morning um, of these native women, North, North American native women who were um, standing, one of them had stood on top of the pedestal where they had taken down the Christopher Columbus statue. So she was standing up there and then a couple of the other women were standing around her. And I was like, at, at first glance, I was like, that's cool. But on, um, upon reflection, I started to think that it's it's symbolic, like metaphoric goal of like how we tend to do this. And I think Quasi's point about understanding power and power structures is really important understanding what our values really are and whether or not, and always raising the question of whether or not our values are compatible with the structure of power um, is the only way we're going to avoid reproducing those power structures that are antithetical to our lives. Um, so what I really would have loved to see is a photograph where the pedestal is taken down, the park is reclaimed by nature, and all the people show up for a native reclamation of the space. But so so again, and I'm again thinking about this metaphorically, I'm thinking the connection between religions, and I'm not just putting Abrahamic religions on the table because I think African religions have some some issues um, that need to be addressed. But religions like monuments do a couple of things. They free a belief system in time to the degree that sometimes it's it's not able to be useful in our current moment. And they truncate history because of that freezing, right? Like I would say that the way people, many people, not all people, many people practice African religions are not historically what they have been. And there's a lot of Christian and Islamic baggage in the religions, the way we practice them now, that we brought with us from the other uh, Abrahamic traditions into African religions. Um, and so that's why I'm always speaking spiritually and not religiously, because I think religion itself is a monument. And to some degree, religion is a relic um, of, of, of practices that, you know, so, some of which have not been pulled through and kind of evolved with time and aren't addressing the needs of people. Um, patriarchy, for instance. There's a, you know, so there's an issue, you know, in these, there are issues within these religions um, that we really need to, to think about. Um, so, I see, so to Christopher's point about acquiescing, um, I'm in agreement with all of the other presenters. Um, I believe we shouldn't be acquiescing to any of these religions. I think we need to really think about religion itself and certain religious structures and, and, and question them. Um, I think engagement is important. That's the point that Gary made, the point that Chris is making. Engaging with them and raising questions and kind of really holding up power itself um, for, for infection. Um, and um, because we're gonna have to, that's the thing, we can't just steamroll over them and act like they're not important to African people. Black folks are so religious, right? <laughs> um, we, like, we, like, we like the structures, we like the symbols, we like all the other things, we like the ritual nature of these things. 
Um, but there is a spirituality that exists exists outside of that. Um, and there's so much more common ground that can be built out there. Um, and that's what Maroons do. They they created out of a bunch of different traditions, dynamic cultures that were useful to them in their time. And um, and I think that that is um, that is something that we really need to think about um, doing, or maybe talking about it in those terms. Excellent point. And, and I just want to also, you're raising a question about religion, right? And about about religion being very static in some cases. Um, and and I wanted to 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 raise a, a point about religion. Religion is a manifestation of culture, and some may agree, some may disagree with me. Which and, and culture is dynamic. Culture is ever changing. Culture is ever moving. So what what I find quite ironic and quite um, interesting is how we believe that religion is outside of a people's culture. It's outside of a manifestation of how culture has changed, right? And so I'm thinking about, um, again, I'm not necessarily a super religious person, but I'm thinking about Rastafarianism. And no one here is necessarily ascribed as, as a Rasta. Maybe someone on our chat is, but, but, but the Rastafari spiritual system or the Rastafari, as a Rastafari, one would ask, you know, is, is this religion about, um, which, which, which has very Catholicism elements, right? Is, is this religious practice or, or is it a religion? Is it, is it a fight against um, Western imperialism? Is it a fight against you know, oppression? Can, can, a, can a religion like Rastafarianism also have negative elements like patriarchy? Like how do we think about these different types of religions that have been created and or the, and or the use of the current, current religions that people are using and turn them into revolutionary elements. So this is this is just what I'm thinking. So I'm just gonna throw that out to the group, but I also wanted to raise a question because we have about 30 minutes left and I wanna make sure that we um, get to everyone's questions because we wanna kind of respect the collective. So there was a comment about, um, and then I want, us, I want us to talk about this religion thing and kind of change gears a bit, you know, we're kind of flipping back and forth, but this is all part of this question about monuments. I saw someone on the chat say, religions are also monuments, right? And, I, and symbols, and I think that this is a particularly important point. We're not just talking about a statue or a flag. So there was a question, I think Kwame um, said this, a sin perhaps. In response to the first speaker, the government, and I'm not sure what this first speaker um, said that, that brought this point up, that the government of Ghana did not target the organizers of the George Floyd service at the Independence Square. It was about consistency. The government had strict rules around large gatherings over 50 people or so to contain COVID-19 prior to the George, prior to George Floyd's assassination. George Floyd. Those who violated the policies were arrested. That's why the diaspora community in Ghana, in collaboration with the Minister of Tourism, gathered in a small number at the Du Bois Center to show solidarity. So let me just say that I'm sure Kwame was at this, I'm not sure if Kwame was at this protest, I was. Um, and this happened at Black Square, Black Star Square, I think June 2nd or something of that nature. And a organizer for the Economic Fighters League was arrested, um, Ernesto Yaboa, who was um, is, is a leader in the organization. And I was at the, the protest. It was called a vigil, right? And and so there's two points to this to this dynamic. The first point is that well, the people there were violating COVID-19 regulations. Um, and then the other point is that um, for some of us who were there, um, there was excessive force, in my opinion, from the military and from the police. Um, if in in fact, the vigil had um, been allowed to just take place, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. The irony of arresting people at a George Floyd uh, vigil or protest against police brutality to me speaks volumes to the fact that uh, the military and police throughout the African continent is part and parcel of this, this, this question about the militarization of of the, the community and, and the people. And this is a similar thing that has happened in Kenya, for example, in a, in a community outside of Nairobi where there was a curfew around COVID-19 and the police shot 
indiscriminately shot a young boy who happened to be a Muslim, who happened to be Muslim, dead as he was laying down on his porch. And there have been protests in Kenya and other spaces around COVID-19 um, um, uh, curfews. And, and there's been this question of the militarization where AFRICOM has come in and trained the police, not just in Ghana, but in other spaces. So those are just some, some thoughts for me, but the question, I think the floor is open around the militarization of police against the people, um, as well as um, this question of how do we transform religion and use culture as a weapon to do so? The floor is open. Okay, Jared, I'll, I'll, I'll jump back in then. You're back in. Welcome back. Oh, Jared, you want to go? No, Quasi. We'll do Quasi and Jared. <laughs> okay. Um, another pushback. Uh, there's this idea, this mythology that African peoples around the world are super religious. Um, uh, like uh, my, my brother, Jared Ball, that's also a myth. Um, and in fact, it's a myth that, that started, you know, sort of historiographically with uh, John, John N. Beatty, right? His, his book, his classic textbook on African religions. Uh, now remember, John N. Beatty was also a minister, a pastor, Christian minister, right? And that's what I was saying before about how entangled these Judeo-Christian ideas and dogmas are so much so that even when people try to be quote unquote revolutionary to push beyond, you know, the borders that it creates, they in fact end up essentially, you know, boomeranging against those borders and essentially thinking through their own, you know, Africanity or African experience through those dogmas. Uh, and that's what I was saying before about Nkrumah, about, um, you know, Sheikh Antajib or Cabral or, or others is that the, the ceiling of their revolutionary thinking and action uh, was in fact this, this, this very potent, you know, ghost-like, you know, dogma that hovers over um, thinking that in many ways crushes or limits possibilities because it itself wants to survive, right? It needs hopes like a virus. It needs to have people that are half alive, you know, to be able to function and exist. And so if you think about the evidence that I'm saying that now today in Europe, there's a widespread unbelief that's rampant in Europe. People are not going to churches right? Because for them, Christianity was and is this relic that was useful in an earlier moment, right? That divorce from this Christianity in Europe began in the 18th century, when people began essentially raising these questions about the monopoly that the Catholic Church had on belief. And so this is how, and that's the same context in the next century that birth of Frederick Engels or Karl Marx, right? there's a pushback against th this monopoly of belief. And where does that monopoly of belief goes since it couldn't find a home in Europe? It goes to the Caribbean. It goes to the Americas. Notice this, that the revolts and rebellions begin to die down after this, the so-called period of apprenticeship in the 1830s, after Christian missionaries, Anglican church, Wesleyan, Methodist, they swoop in in what was called the sort of great revival period, right? Um, and who do they who do they begin to crash Christian and baptize and bring under their fold the formerly enslaved people who with no assets who are vulnerable who are essentially waiting for something to tell them this promise this mythology that things will be better right and so it's not surprising that the, the places that have the largest increase in Christian orthodoxy are the African continent is the Caribbean basin is so-called Latin America. It's not in Europe because they realized that this, in fact, was a relic, was a shrine that was useful for a particular moment in time, but it has outlived its use. And that's why unbelief is so rampant in Europe. And that's why fanatical Christianity is so rampant, conversely, in Africa and in the Americas. And so this idea that African peoples are intrinsically, you know, super religious is, is a fiction, is a myth, right? And I say that to also say that we have to distinguish spirituality from religion. Religion, religion is institutionalized dogma. Mm -hmm. There are prophets, there are books, there are hymns, there are, there are the particular regimen to it. This is one thing that I find in my studies of Maroons in, in South American Caribbean. 
to so all the maroon places that were visited by missionaries and therefore they came into the historical European record, these missionaries discovered one thing that was so confounding. They said this, for example, in Suriname, when the Moravian missions came there in the late 18th century, early 90s, they found that they could not find this thing called religion amongst them. Why? Because everything that they did was so tightly braided into what we call culture. That it, religion is a separate manifestation. So by separate, I mean anyone can be a Christian, a Muslim, um, a Buddhist, etc. But not everyone can be Navajo, Tupi, right? Akan, Yoruba. You have to be born in through culture. And, and that's the distinction I tried to make before. Probably I failed at it. But, you know, we need to, I think, make that clear distinction um, otherwise, we become entrapped into this mythology that African people are so religious, and therefore that explains, you know, their religiosity. That is a myth that they have been seduced to believe. And I've just given you, I guess, some bit of evidence to, you know, for us to discuss further. No, I. Um, oh. You know, I. You're on. You're on. I don't disagree with that at all, other than to say uh, my only point would be that uh, however we got here, uh, there does. So I wouldn't argue necessarily that it's innate or inherent to being an African person that you have this level of spirituality or religious belief. But the, however, but but uh, it does seem as though we have ended up here, whether through the uh, enslavement and colonization process, the mistaken historiography that you point out, or the, the bias historiography, however you want to put it. Uh, uh, you know, but but it does seem to me, and I have, uh, you know, I have no science behind this, but it does seem to me, and, and just in my experience in, in organizing, that there is a great degree of some sort of adherence to uh, those concepts uh, that play a role in how people engage whatever activism they engage. So this is why, you know, I've, I've felt that even in my own experience, the approach of Malcolm X, for instance, uh, uh, held, continues to hold weight. That is, um, uh, you know, temporarily leave our religious identification in the closet and build around certain uh, material political policies and, and, and strategies. Uh, and then we'll come back to some of these disagreements later if, if in fact, they exist. Uh, and maybe to your point, Quasi, they don't necessarily exist. So, so my initial comment to this question was just simply going to be uh, by preference and by mm -hmm. tactical experience, I think it's better served um, or it has been uh, an, uh, an approach that has served me the best. I'll say it that way. To engage people around that that point, to say, look, we should just be focused on certain political projects, uh, um, and not try to solve the grand uh, questions over uh, metaphysics or the immaterial world, uh, and that's why I've, I try to develop those kinds of statements. You know, you know, um, uh, you know that I was talking about earlier. Uh, you know, that is, how do you define your your religious or spirituality, and and how it should in in in, in function in this world. Uh, and to the extent that it encourages a material engagement, a militant and radical one that's redistributionist in its outcome, I'm good. And then we can come back later and 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 talk about some of the rest. But uh, uh, largely, I, I fully agree with that that important uh, pushback, uh, Quasi, and uh, uh, um, and certainly thank you for offering it. Hey, I I just wanted to jump in really quickly. I agree as well um, with the You're comment. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, because I was the one who said black folks are religious. So I'm gonna own that. That that was me, and I don't think I meant that they they are just, they are inherently religious. So I don't think that's the point I'm trying to make. I do think spiritual culture, to your point, um, Jiba, is is it's culture, and this is a point. And BT actually makes in his his work, which is that most of these African languages don't even have a word for religion. You go ask them what's their religion, they're like, what are you talking about, right? There, it is a, it is just their culture, it's life ways, right? Um, that are spiritual in nature. You sweep out your house in the morning, you know, you're not just getting rid of dirt, you're getting, you know, you're cleaning out scale and energy and, and you, you're resetting your, the, the space, right? So. It's not something seen as separate, but what I was addressing is, is religions. And that is, I think, 
The degree to which African people are part of these religious institutions is directly related to slavery and colonization. So that that is what can't be ignored, that it happened. It is a, it is a thing, it is a set of conditions that many of us are living under. And to what extent we are really spiritually tied and, and devoted in religious institutions, that's, a, that's another question entirely. And I do think there's a, an important tradition of unbelief that we should think about. Um, although I don't think unbelief period is necessarily the answer, I think, again, drawing that very important distinction between spirituality and religion is important. I don't think spirituality itself should be left behind because of its close ties to culture. To the point of being made in the co in the comments in the chat, you know, people see Malcolm and Martin as cultural and political heroes, not religious icons necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not a Muslim, but Malcolm is one of my, you know, political heroes. And so, um, so I think it could even be argued that that black folks. Uh, you know, who are attached to these religious or religions or raised in these institutions have used them over time. And we can see that over and over and over again throughout history as organizing bodies, as organizing spaces, spaces that we can take advantage of where there's a common language or there's a common set of values that we know we might all share. And then we move forward with through that, right? These are, these are imposed institutions um, that we have again tried to appropriate for our own purposes, not necessarily that we ourselves are um, naturally inclined to be Christians or Muslims or anything like that. Um, but the the another thing I wanted to raise is another African spiritual tradition that came to mind, but that's Voodoo and that's Hoodoo and these traditions that I think are really mm -hmm. important. Um, I call them tradition. There's obviously people who will call them religions, and, and there's some debate about that in some circles. Um, but these are traditions, spiritual traditions, spiritual systems that came about in response to um, the putting together of people under crisis, the crisis of slavery and colonization. Um, and I think when we think about what, what the revolutionary potential is, what is the, 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 the cultural process uh, by which these traditions came to be? Um, and think about like what that means for going forward for all of us. Like, should we all be practicing Vodou because it's a revolutionary tradition? You know, should we all be, you know what I mean? Like, what is the thing that we can, um, we can learn from? Excellent, thank you so much. And, and I wanted to also just highlight that uh, Jonathan Springer said, said a great point. Um, he said, when people say that Africans tend to be more religious, which is in line with a lot of what we're saying, they're conflating spirituality with religious religiosity. Also with the center of Christianity shifting to the global South, what are your thoughts on the indigenization process of Christianity? And I would throw in Islam also. Once you all answer this question, I want us to shift because we have a couple, we have about 13 minutes and we surely want to respect people's time. So I want to um, ask the rest of the questions and then I'm going to give everyone an opportunity to do a sum up. So we'll also bring Todd back in to do a sum up. So do, does anyone want to take this question about Christianity and Islam kind of shifting to the global South? And also just let me say that there's um, some debate or question about even this term, the global South, what does that even mean, right? And 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 is the global South an ideological space, a physical space, a geographical space? And and quite frankly, um, the, there's a global North which presupposes power. The global South presupposes lack of power. Is this what we're saying? So just kind of a, a thought process about what that means. Um, I also use the term global South, but the, the floor is open again. Uh, I, I just chime in very quickly and then you can uh, uh, happily replace me with Todd. Uh, you, one, my, my initial sure. question is always the same. Um, well, one, global South is meant to, to signify a relationship to those in power, uh, as you point out, not just, mm -hmm. and in that sense, I don't think that there, there is this grand shift. So mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure what is meant uh, and what, uh, and I've seen the claim, but I'm not entirely sure that 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 a what is meant by it or b uh, that I would agree in the sense that um, if the global shift means um, uh, a, a, an attempt to to scramble for the the capture of more souls, so to speak, perhaps. 
uh, even given what Quasi was saying about the 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 disbelief, the movement of disbelief in Europe. Uh, but really, my 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 point would be as as religions often accompany uh, imperialism. Uh, the question for me is if it is this global shift. Uh, is there a is there a material parallel to this global shift? In other words, are resources and wealth and and political power also migrating to the so-called global south, which I, I fear is is not the case. Uh, even as we see in this country, people talk about a move to white people becoming a numerical minority. Uh, um, that just that just puts us in more of a of a traditional apartheid relationship because they still have a monopoly of all the wealth and power, political and, and military, etc. So so that would be how I would encourage people to to address themselves to that question, uh, as 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 you know as, as people consider whether or not there is a repositioning uh, of centers, religious or otherwise, to the global south. Excellent. Thank you so much. So we're going to bring Todd back in. Um, the floor is open, Kwesi or ILA. The floor is open. Really quick, Ayala? what Jared was just saying brought to mind again. And um, the, the use of, uh, I guess, the global north taking advantage of the, you know, certain crises, the earthquake followed by the hurricane, and kind of holding resources, you know, hostage and, and basically kind of forcing people in this very neo-colonialist kind of fashion to convert or go hungry, convert or do not receive medical supplies. Um, and that, I mean, so it's, I don't think, I think when we talk about the, the shift toward, you know, the, the Christianizing of the global South, we should be really talking about some, some passive like acceptance that, that, that black and brown people are kind of like, seeking out these religions but these are um these are religions that are being again once again forced on people um in exchange you know in, in exchange for certain types of resources that they need based on kind of manufactured um poverty and all these other crisis situations excellent and and Chris, do you want to uh chime in here yeah. sure um I, I, I'll, I'll say this very, very quickly. Um, religions are, are parasites. That is, they once more they they need hosts. They need to find new ground. Much like the COVID, you know, virus. Uh, if you look at the, the COVID virus as as a parallel, sort of a, as a living metaphor, the rate of death is going down in most places, but the rate of infection is going up. And what explains the, this, this sort of parallel universe or outcome is, is, is the very nature of, of viruses and parasites. They want to live, right? And they need hosts to live. So killing you know, the potential host is, is, is really defeatist, right? And so the death rates are going down precisely because the virus needs to live and it needs to have a host. And so the same thing for these parasitic religions, they need to have hosts, in other words, I'm referring to them as parasites, not because I have anything against them, but because they are the only ones that dispatch missionaries, right? That is the idea of dispatching a missionary mm -hmm. to, to not simply have an intellectual debate about whether you should believe what I believe or not, but to come, as, as Yelly pointed out, um, through the NGOs, right? Through the missionary organizations. The missionaries, by the way, if anyone's unfamiliar in Africa and, and the Americas, they control three important spaces, the schooling, the clinics and hospitals, and of course the theology, the church, which which also functions sometimes as a school, and so, and these are the ones who, in fact, in, reinterpret in, you know local languages uh, into the quote unquote gospels and vice versa, and so they are in fact the most successful colonizer. In fact, I would argue the most successful global colonizer is is, is not Islam or Christianity; it's Jesus. It's the idea of Jesus. And once you reconcile with that, then you have to reconcile with the incompatibility of being a part of that theology with your political outlook. Um, there's really no gray area there in my mind. And that means people will have to do some real soul searching about, again, the incompatibility of these parasitic religions and the, their attachment to it historically or otherwise, as well as the fact that most of these religions, including indigenous ones that are called so, um, that, that they are essentially 
what's offered within the state. So for example, if you live in an Islamic society, then, then Islam, most of us would probably be Muslims, right? It's not because we have any affinity naturally to Islam, because that is the social and political context in which we have to survive. And because we've yielded whatever power we've had to the idea that we can't beat it. And so we acquiesce. And so what we have is a collection of acquiescence across the globe. And again, until we confront this, how this power works and confront how that power is tightly braided with belief, with religious belief, you know, everything else to me is a non-starter. I don't think you can, you know, organize on political level when people are being driven by these ideologies going a different direction. To me, one, excuse me? One, one day uh, we're going to be intellectually free enough to teach black religion properly. And, and I'm gonna give a one minute example of this from the black American experience to kind of prove, I think, everything that you're talking about. What if the most important thing we taught about Harry Tubman was that she prayed for her master to die and her master died two weeks later? What if the most important thing we taught about Ida B. Wells is that when she went later on to go visit these black men who were in prison unjustly and they were singing about dying and everything. Now, Ida B. Wells is a, is a devout Christian. That's what anybody knows who reads her autobiography. And she says, you know, you keep singing about dying. You don't sing about living. Why don't you sing to live? If your God is so powerful, why can't he tear down these prison walls? Sing about that. Now, Ida B. Wells also said a Winchester rifle should have a place of honor in every black home. If we connected religion to freedom from our own perspective, not from the perspective mm -hmm. of Catholic religious theology or you know, revolutionary theology or whatever, but if we just literally taught that black religion was an expression of freedom of humanity, we, we would, if not solve the religious question, at least be far along uh, in, in counteracting the negatives of it. Excellent. And, and I think we have about less than five minutes left. And I think that this Todd and Quasi and Ayala and Jara, you all are really tying this in. And, and I know some people in the audience may be thinking, what's going on here? We, we, we started with you know, rebel, rebel to rebel, you know, you got no flag, you got no country, and now we're talking about religion. But I think what I think is a particularly important point is when the masses have said, the masses on our call here, that religious, religions, religion is also symbols, they're also statutes, right? And it, and it reminds us that when we're thinking about of even tearing down these statues of Christopher Columbus or whoever, we also need to begin to tear down other symbols of oppression and repression in our community. So what I want to do is I want to give everyone 30 seconds to just do a roundup. We'll do a couple of announcements and then we're going to close this. We had a couple questions about black colleges, which hopefully we'll get to the next time. And we have some availability uh, to do some chatting on our um, on our platform. So we welcome you to do that. Uh, sister, do you want to go ahead and give us 30 second roundup? Yes, please. You're Sorry. welcome. Sorry. Yeah. I was, I was, um, I, I don't. I'm going to offer my other commenters. This was great. I yield my thanks. Excellent. Thank you well. so much. Uh, is anyone going to take the 30 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I'm forced. Well, I guess I'm forced to. <laughs> um, <laughs> sure, sure. So, in, in 30 seconds, I'll, I'll pick up on, on Todd's excellent point, which is that for many of these theologies, freedom is is forestalled, right? It is delayed until the next world, right? Okay. Which I think is a, is enough indication about how <laughs> much of of an incompatibility they are, right? It's delayed, right? Something you can get later, right? And so um, I think that should be sufficient, you know, to, as a threshold to, to, to stay or leave. But to, to sort of wrap, wrap things up, um, I want to say, first of all, that I want to thank the folks who joined us to take out um, a few minutes of their time to um, be a part of this. I certainly want to thank my um, colleagues here who I've actually learned quite a bit from uh, in, in this discussion. And so uh, I always come as, as, as a student to see what I can learn. And I guess from whatever my two cents may be is that um, we have to grasp, you know, really and truly the manifold ways in which power work and doesn't work. Um, and part of how power works is, is, is the ability to 
to allow you to think that you can participate and that participation um, means that you should no longer uh, contest the, the very power itself. And so for all the punditry, all the people, you know, that, that um, you know, look like you and I on, on, on the MSNBC, CNN and Fox News that are coming out of the woodworks with books and, and how to guides, um, that's it, precisely how power works. It gives you the illusion that you can participate in this to an extent. <laughs> Uh, and that participation means you yield, you know, your, your, your whatever remaining that, you know, life you have of your, your power, your innate power um, to think that participation is, 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 is the end. And so um, I'm, I'm reading all of this as really um, the, the, the power of.